Sir Vidya's shadow, chronicling his 30-year friendship with author V.S. Naipaul. Next, Biography on Book TV takes you to Seattle, Washington, where Mr. Thoreau was interviewed about this book by another author, Jonathan Rabin, as part of the Northwest Book Fest. Hello, uh, I'm Jonathan Rabin. This is Paul Theroux. And Paul and I have what you might call a literary friendship. Um, I say literary friendship, which sounds possibly pretentious, but um, writers can be friends with other writers without necessarily having a literary friendship. It seems to me that literary friendship is something that happens when the whole core and heart of the friendship is about writing itself and the writing of both people. Uh, two writers can go off fishing together or drinking together. They didn't necessarily have a literary friendship. One of the aspects of our friendship is that um, we swap manuscripts very often chapter by chapter uh, with new works turning up on the other person's fax machine in episodes of maybe 20 or 30 pages of, at a time. And one of my great pleasures last year uh, was to have episodes faxed to me of a terrific book by Paul, which he was then writing, which seemed to me to be the funniest, truest, most accurate portrait of how one becomes a writer and of the writing life, um, true in every detail to the pounds, shillings, and pence, or dollars and cents, how you make money, how you fail to make money, how it is to endure failure, and how it is to weather success, um, and of all the sort of small details of the writing writing life, from the interruption of writing a book review to breaking off work on a novel in order to write a blurb for a friend's book, and centrally, the importance of being recognized by one other writer friend, and of the importance of friendship in the life of writing. And incidentally, the book uh, was tribute to Paul's closest writer friend when he started out, uh, the novelist B.S. Naipaul, whom Paul met in Africa. And um, let me just quote a paragraph. A paragraph you won't, by the way, probably have seen quoted in reviews much. After all these years, I never took this friendship for granted. I felt lucky to know him, privileged to be with him, blessed for all his good advice, cautioned by his mistakes, stimulated by his intellect, enlightened by his work. I was aware of his contradictions. More than anything, I was inspired by the dignity of his struggle. Writing tormented him. He suffered through each book. Sometime early this year, puffs of black smoke started to appear in the press. Uh, betrayal, you will remember, was in the air. Linda Tripp had just chopped Monica Lewinsky, and Joyce Maynard had just chopped J.D. Salinger. And Paul's book, uh, which at that time wasn't, wasn't even in proof and hadn't been read by the journalists who were commenting on it, was sort of roped in to this um, betrayal theme. Paul had betrayed his friend, V.S. Naipaul. And there's the smoke of the press stories and the reviews, most of them written by journalists, um, has desperately obscured the true, funny, accurate, and affectionate book, which I read as it came out over the fax machine. And I think our first job in this conversation is to re-anchor that book where it, where it properly should be, which it seems to me 
is a book about the writing life and setting up shop as a writer and the, the crucial importance of friendship in that trade. Thank you, John. That's true. That's true. I, uh, and it's, you know, the hardest thing, uh, I suppose, for a writer, or let's say at the beginning of, they say in the beginning was the word, but in the beginning wasn't the word. In the beginning was uh, chaos and, and uh, confusion. Well, I started out as a very confused little boy, and then I was a confused teenager. I was, the, the desire to write is bound up with a lot of confusion. It's um, when people say, I, I want to be a writer, what should I do? Should I go to graduate school? I, I say, stage one, leave home. Just leave, go away, get away from your parents. And uh, get away from people who are going to ask you questions to which you don't have the answer. In a sense, all the, this search for uh, an outlet for the creative impulse is bound up also with doing funny accents, doing voices, telling stories, reading, trying to imagine what it is to create. If, you're, if it's a writer, you're, you're immediately writing and you're imitating. When you, what you need most of all is for someone to say, I mean, the, the miracle would be someone say, I know you haven't written anything, but you're a writer. I know you're a writer and uh, you're going to be a successful writer. You've got it. And don't worry, it's going to happen. Parents don't do that because parents don't know. Parents want you to be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or uh, you know something respectable. Parents have a vested interest in your not being a writer in a way because writing, the writing personality is essentially dysfunctional. We're not normal people. You're looking at two geeks. We're two, we're two problem children. <laughs> and and uh, the desire is to meet another one. We're people who speak this other language. And so you wander the earth hoping that you'll meet one. You'll meet another person like yourself. When I was growing up, I was rejected. I wasn't a little leaguer. I, I, you know, I wasn't on the teams. Teams are interested in winning. You know, they, they, marijuana is bad, of course, but high school sports are probably worse. <laughs> <laughs> so if you... Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway so, they, they, so I found myself on the margins with the weirdos. I'm sure you're either a loner or if you're with anyone, you're with the weirdos, you're with the geeks. And um, that's not a bad thing. It means that when you, ha that you, when you have a friendship, you're going to have a friendship with another weirdo and, or another person who's going to prop you up. The nature of friendship isn't sexual desire. It's not the desire to procreate. It's meeting someone and sharing a common language and, and, and maybe a common destiny. I'm being funny when I say weirdo. Weirdo is in quotation marks. Geek is in quotation marks. We're uh, unacknowledged, uh, you know, we're, we're poets and uh, creators and in our own minds, brilliant. And we say, can't you see it on my face? I'm a writer, I'm a creator, I'm going, I, something's going to happen to me. I know I'm destined for great things. I'm the Dalai Lama. I just haven't been found yet. You know, I've got all the vital signs of the Dalai Lama. I just, you know, the, the wise men haven't come and said, you're the Dalai Lama. So, but you know that you are and that you, you have this message to impart. So what Jonathan's saying is true, that, that, that it's in the nature of the search, it's in the nature of the solitude and loneliness of writing to wish to meet a kindred soul. And that happened to me by meeting V.S. Naipaul. It also happened to me meeting Jonathan, and uh, that was only a few years after that. In other words, my relationship with Naipaul, well, friendship with Naipaul, who is a mentor, mentor is a great relationship to have. In my book, uh, Servidia's Shadow, is, is a description of what it, what it means to have not only a friend, but a role model, a mentor, to be the sorcerer's apprentice, and then to learn sorcery, to be a sorcerer myself, and then in competition with the sorcerer, and then the sorcerer's got a wife, the sorcerer's got problems, you know, and I get a wife, and I get problems. It's, it's, it's all, it's not just a little simple Disney story of a little Mickey Mouse sweeping. It's, a, I'm a big complicated person with problems, and sorcerer has even bigger problems. So that, the, that this mental relationship is amazing for that reason. And 
has not been written about much. I mean, if any of you are challenged to, to name a book by a writer about another writer, about this other writer's influence, uh, you'd be hard pressed to name more than a half a dozen, and I doubt whether you can name three. I mean, by let all me, means, come me, up let afterwards. Let me offer you at this point a useful <laughs> feed, which is um, Boswell's Life of Johnson, which is the account of one writer of a kind uh, about another. Um, Tell about Boswell and Johnson and the book's reception. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, you know who I mean by James Boswell, right? And Boswell uh, met Dr. Johnson after he, Boswell had become somewhat famous and wrote The Life of Dr. Johnson. And the book came out, and his reviews were indistinguishable from my reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and it just so happens. <laughs> okay, what happened when, when my book came I didn't read my reviews. My reviews were so crap. They were so... Ro I wanted to, people to say, this book rocks. This is great. This is a good book. I thought, I worked long and hard at this book. I wanted, and I thought, well, I'm writing. You know, this is, I'm, I'm inside. I've, as a traveler, I've got inside countries, inside people. As a literary traveler, I thought I'd got inside Naipaul. I, I had absolutely eviscerated him, and, and there he is all out, you know, anatomy, anatomized on the table, table as though I had done this dissection. There he is for everyone to see. See, here's a good part. Here's his brain, really interesting. Um, here's, uh, another, here's his tongue. His tongue's wagging away. You know, here's cojones, not very big. Here's all that stuff. <laughs> there it is. Uh, anyway, Boswell's, um, so Boswell did the same to Johnson, right? Wrote a book about him. The St. James Chronicle said, Mr. Boswell's Life of Johnson must certainly be allowed on the whole to be peculiarly authentic, very amusing, and in general, very interesting. We cannot, however, help being of the opinion that there are many superfluous pages. Uh, Boswell was criticized for his brutal severity for his passive, fawning insensitivity. You know, I, I suppose I was the same thing. Um, a striking likeness of a confident, overweening, dictatorial pedant. Though parts in learning, and a weak, shallow, submissive admirer of such a character, deriving a vanity from that very admiration. Is that me and Naipaul, or is that Boswell and Johnson? It happens to be Boswell and Johnson. But I, am I a weak, shallow, submissive admirer? <laughs> anyway, it's that kind of thing. He was criticized. He said that, I, uh, that Boswell was criticized for taking liberties with uh, personal reciting um, uh, or uh, repeating personal conversations with him. I think that one of the reasons for, uh, as far as I can see it, for the reception of Sir Vidya's shadow is because it is perceived to have broken a taboo without most of the people who've written about it realizing exactly what taboo it is that, it's, that has been broken here. What gaff has been blown in this book? It seems to me rather obvious um, that the real revelation of this book is of the writer's life as needy and shut in and nerdy. And here are two writers who populate this book, who inhabit this book together, um, being, both of them being exposed, Naipaul and Paul himself, in a way that people who write about writers never want to have to see them. They want to see writers as creatures of authority, you know? Um, the glossy photograph on the, bat, on the book jacket. Uh, they want to read those words untainted by the horrible thoughts of what the writer actually went through in the process of putting the book together, uh, where the original idea came from, the sort of the scumminess of considering the writer's life, uh, you know, with with the the empty coffee cups in this hellhole of a study, um, as in weird solitude. I mean, you can't imagine actually how how completely solitary the average working day of a writer is as he commutes from his bedroom to his study 
and sits and sits down, speaking to nobody on the whole during the day, except maybe the occasional telephone call. Um, it looks like a case for the psychiatrist. You know, the moment you, you put a camera over that life, um, you know, you could start raising, raising, raising money for the way that it's lived. And I think that in some ways, uh, Savidia's shadow is a wonderful portrait of the realities of that life, but also a portrait that on the whole, people who read books don't much want to learn about. They don't, they don't want to see writers' lives as being like that. They want them to have this, this gloss, like the picture on the back of the cover. Uh, that may be true, I, but we could have testimony from this assembled crowd to see whether they're interested or not. I know that when I was growing up, and uh, when I wanted to be a writer, and I'm sure this is true of you too, that weren't you very, very eager to know the details of a, of a writer's life? Didn't you read literary biography all the time? And you're not reading about how did he write the book, you're wondering about what he had for breakfast or what she did and, and, and where they traveled and, and how they wrote. Did they use a pencil? Did they have a notebook? Any, you seize on any apparently unconsidered trifle of a writer's life just to compare your life. Am I as weird as that? Will I have to do that? Am I like that? So that when biography it becomes like hagiography, which is often is, when one writer is writing about another writer, they'll say, I'll never forget the time, such a wonderful person, such an exquisite stylist, suffering over a word, suffering every moment, and all. But, you know, but what you really want to hear is, what did they say in their private moments? I remember actually um, spending a very productive week with uh, Jorge Luis Borges in Buenos Aires. I was fascinated by what, he was blind, as you know, Borges was blind, and he wrote these wonderful things, PMNR, the Aleph, the uh, Labyrinths, and Dr. Brody's report. You know who I mean by Borges. But I wanted to see, what, what did he eat? How did he live? How did he go around? He's blind. He, um, what were his private opinions? Because he's such a scholar and an antiquarian, what books did he like? What did he talk about? And there was a side of Borges that was a pedant and wanted to talk about Anglo-Saxon or Middle English or England or his Yorkshire ancestors. And another, he wanted to talk about Evita Peron and how she got a great reputation for, for, for uh, fellatio. Evita was very big on fellatio. You could see her big lips that was used to her, repu her reputation, you see. The um, Lewinsky of her day, I guess. <laughs> anyway, she went a lot farther. I mean, I'm not saying don't cry for me, Argentina is wonderful. But he, he used to talk about, yes, this is what you like to do. This, because she had been a prostitute. So, uh, and he said, boys, I remember saying, whenever you saw a group of people talking in, in uh, Buenos Aires, you see a little cluster laughing, you knew they were always laughing about Evita. Anyway, not to be too boring <laughs> on this subject, although it's a pretty good subject. Uh, he, Borges was tremendously interested in the repressive politics of Argentina. And, and reading things, detective stories, and talking about Robert Louis Stevenson, but also talking about traveling to Texas and New England writers and transcendentalists. And he was interested in absolutely everything. And I mean, it, that's surely a mark of that, that writers who are friends talk about, they talk about everything. They gossip and money is a big subject and so forth. But when we were talking earlier, you said, um, we were talking about how there's two kinds of friendship with a writer, there's, there's, or oh, there's many kinds, but one, one type, there, there are golfing buddies. There are writers who are golfing buddies, and then there's, there are other categories. Maybe you can explain that. Um, only to the extent that, yeah, and then there, but there I, are all, I, I actually met, I met um, John Updike's golf partner once, <laughs> a Greek guy whose name I can't remember. Who, but he wasn't a writer. He was a writer. Oh. And I asked him about Updike's writing, and, I didn't know about you, but he, but he was basically talking about, well, he, the thing about Updike is he shanks his, and I said, really? <laughs> but what about his lapidary prose? And they, you know, so he did. But actually, he, uh, yeah, I met him. Mm. So there are, anyway, go on, you were saying. No, keep, keep going. No, 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 I have nothing more to say on the <laughs> subject of golf. <laughs> God, I just exhausted my fun of information. No, but you were talking about, no, this other level is the, is the thing. I think, there, there is, um, uh, Richard Ford, um, I don't know whether you saw that piece in the New Yorker a few weeks ago, uh, where Richard Ford was writing about Ray Carver, um, and um, he had a, 
a luminous paragraph on literary friendships. Literary friendships are a complex, tricky business, frequently volatile, often impurely understood by their core participants. They typically hinge on the very issues both parties are likely to feel least secure about, yet wish to feel most secure about because of their importance, the character and fate of one's writing. They routinely eventuate in absurd miscalculations, unwinnable confusions, and deep rivalries, often so at odds with amity as never to be set right. And Ford went on to say rather sweetly, Ray and I, however, never had any of that. <laughs> but I think that's true. I think that that's why it's so much safer to be the writer's golf buddy or fishing buddy or drinking buddy um, than it is to have the kind of friendship which is a sort of mutual support system for the two people's writing because it does result in that inevitably anxious, prickly, competitive, uh, people getting alarmed when their friend's book suddenly scores a large success, um, uh, constantly measuring up their own books against their friend's books. It's, it's tricky and difficult. Easier to play golf. Yes, uh, but I also think that, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking, that, uh, how does this come about? One is, over the years, writers are such cannibals, you know? Um, some cannibals cure themselves of cannibalism by eating spam. You know, it's like, it's the methadone of can can we just eat spam, because it's, it, it's the nearest approximation of human flesh in a can, and you say, oh, if I eat enough spam, I'll get, I'll rid myself of a desire to devour my friend. But, um, or corned beef. But anyway, uh, I was thinking that there's a, there's a stage where a, a writer has a friend, and over the years, he begins to understand that this friend never treads on his territory, that never steals his stories, never purloins a nice phrase, um, in a way remains true to what he or she is doing, and doesn't kind of use the other's material. Do you know what I mean? And, and, mm -hmm. and that this, just very, very subtly, this assurance reaches the writers, I spoke because it has to happen to both of them, that you can say something in, in, in confidence and it won't be used. Since a writer is, is cannibalistic in this way and sees and, and tends to, to snap up things um, all the time, all the time, and use them, and often use them unconsciously, that, uh, you know, no, no, not deliberate, uh, that someone, someone tells a joke or, sa or says something. Um, I mean, someone told me something yesterday, and I thought, God, that's usable. Someone said um, that, that her son said, uh, I'd rather sit alone in the dark in a room than talk to a butthead like you. I said, really <laughs> said that? Gee, that's awful. Well, then, but, it, but the thing is, as soon as I got on the plane, I wrote, I wrote I'd rather sit alone in the, in the, in the dark uh, uh, than talk to a butthead like you. you know? <laughs> that's pretty good. And I was thinking, you know, that's what a, a kid might say to him. You know, there was something else I wrote down here that... Uh, Oh, uh, the Boswell thing was the impropriety of reporting private conversations. Anyway, not to di diver diverge too far, but one of the things we, d we haven't spoken about is if you tell me a story, I don't use the story. If I tell you a story, I don't see it in print in a, in a, in a different way. And I had that relationship with Naipaul. Naipaul used to say things, and they were his things. They were his obsessions and his principles, his anecdotes and his lines. And I always thought, those are his, and these are mine. And I never kind of intruded on that territory. And I think that probably a writer has a natural instinct for, for, for seeing if the, the friend isn't somehow using, the, even unconsciously using that information. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, yes. And I think, I think that sort of territory demarcation is hugely important because it is the territory demarcation indeed of two cannibals. And if they start to eat each other, um, yeah. Neither is going to exist. From my, my, also, from my notebook, um, got lots of little quotations in it relevant to the subject. From today's New York Times, Cynthia Ozick, 
We are cannibals. I think it's a terrible thing to be a friend of, an acquaintance of, a relative of, a writer. To which might also be added um, that fine remark, um, somewhere I think in To Have and Have Not by Ernest Hemingway, where um, a couple are having a drunken quarrel and uh, the wife at the end wins with the last most unanswerable insult of all. She simply swears to her husband, you writer. But I was going to say, not fine young cannibals. We're kind of cannibals without principles. I mean, you know, there, are all, there are a lot of nice cannibals out there. We don't want to disparage all those um, fine young cannibals, but um, that's a pop group, by the way. Uh, that's a group. But what I think is, is worth saying and, and exploring a bit is that this friendship between writers seems to me to have become more important over the last... 25, 30 years, simply as a consequence of the way in which literary life is now conducted. Um, once upon a time, there were people like Maxwell Perkins, you know, the famous editor who was his author's first and most attentive reader, their banker, their friend, their companion through the length of their career. That's all gone now, because uh, even when Paul and I started publishing books, publishing houses were relatively small things. You know, you, you might even get to deal with a partner in the publishing house. They were privately owned, at least the London ones certainly still were. Um, and and uh, 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 the relationship of a writer and his publisher was thought to be this kind of lifelong association. This has all changed in the world of corporate pub publishing when Rupert Murdoch owns half the publishing houses in existence. Um, uh, it's become a swing door business in which editors move so fast that if you sign up a book with one editor, uh, the chances that he will still be resident in that house by the time you come to deliver the manuscript are slight. Um, writers themselves move, move from house to house in a way that they never used to do. In fact, uh, both Paul's and my progress, in the, I, I've had three separate editors in the course of the last five years. Paul probably has had at least three, four. Yeah. Um, this means, that, I know, but plus, by the way, you get editors um, who no longer actually have time to edit. Um, there was a story in the New York Times not long ago in which Judith Regan of uh, Simon & Schuster, I think, uh, was saying that it was very sad, but unfortunately she no longer really had time to edit in the traditional way. She couldn't spend as much time with her authors. She didn't actually say at the same time that this was because she was so busy um, running her own cable television chat show, which she does on the side, and also uh, setting up her own independent film production company. It's not really surprising that she doesn't have that much time to spend working at Simon & Schuster. Um, but um, w in this situation of authors moving publishing houses, editors moving through publishing houses at practically the speed of light, the last remaining secure association that writers ha have is likely to be with each other. And I think they've been, over recent years, thrown more and more back on each other as the kind of traditional support system uh, that they used to be able to expect from the publishing house, so the, 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 the whole structure of the literary industry. I think writers have become more isolated and in the process of becoming more isolated have become more dependent on this kind of friendship to sustain them in their work. In fact, they look now not to the, their publishers for recognition, for understanding, for reading of their work, for all of those things. They look more and more to their friends who are other writers, and, may, and usually to that one friend who, is it, who they feel to be in tune with their work. No, I think I, I, I totally agree with that. It, it's the nature of corporate, uh, this is a book fair, so it's a bit like you know, farting in church, but to say that publishing is, has changed, but, it, but actually crepitate away is what I say. Um, the, the corporate 
the corporate world of publishing it means that they have to sell as many books as possible, which means that you publish fewer books. They don't generally publish much poetry. You never see a play published. When I was growing up, publishers published everything. They published essays, short stories, plays, poetry, um, you know, verse, play. They published everything. And now the lists are much smaller. Uh, my publisher does publish poetry. I don't uh, know about plays, but the, the profit motive is so strong that, and, and, the, and the corporate instinct and corporate mergers are so intense that you find that lists are simplified. What they're looking for are blockbusters. Well, as you know, Jonathan and I are two blockbusters, but actually <laughs> it would, it's tough if anyone starting, that was a joke, by the way, not a blockbuster. <laughs> Wouldn't want to be thought of that way. But anyway, the the, uh, the, the nature of publishing is 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 that it's it, 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 at bottom it's a business. But it, there was a pretense of taste and friendship and and I can't suppose civility about it before. At least your link your your link you had your publisher. People talked about my publisher, my editor. Well, that's gone by the board. Uh, what you do is you you turn in a book. Someone gets the book, someone looks at the book, and then you ready the book for publication. The idea of nurturing a book is, is, is pretty foreign to publishing today, and no one should seriously expect it. It's a, uh, it, it's a very difficult world because it's the corporate world, and, and friendship isn't friendship. You really can't be very frank because people are moving along. And um, I also wanted to define, I suppose, or make a distinction because we were talking about friendship. Friendship isn't... Um, it's not love. It's not, or it, it's a kind of love, I suppose. But it's not. In the animal world, animals find mates by looking at a, at someone who's, the the, the uh, 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 it's um, it's mate as uh, uh, as strong and symmetrical with the right DNA to advance the pack. A, an animal that's weak, that limps, that's cross-eyed, falls behind and is pounced on by uh, the uh, predatory animal. The successful hunters in Africa are the hyenas, they're the, they're the dogs. It's not elephants and lions and leopards. It's, it's packs of dogs. That, that just, they just look for the weak one and they pounce. But in, in the human world, a friend is, is, a friendship is a much purer thing. You're friendly with a person because you recognize this other quality, this, the need in the person, and, this, and sharing this trust. As I say, the writer not using uh, the, the stories. So when a a friendship is, is a wonderful thing, but a, a love affair, as many of you are aware, is a very ragged thing. It's like a lot of oily rags that might burst into flame at any moment if you, if you sit on them too long, you know, and uh, uh, when people, I don't want to see you anymore, you know, and I think this is over. It's not over. There's phone calls, there's letters, and people say, you know, she's pretty unhappy. I think she needs... But when a friendship ends, it's gone. The trust is gone. It's over. Move on. Take a hike. Get in a taxi. It's over. It never, it never reconstitutes itself. Love affairs often do. People like pouncing on each other and you know, say, give me another chance. That's some libidinous thing. There's no libido in friendship. And that's why it's probably it's so trustworthy. It's so trusting and this, this, uh, and it's productive, I suppose, in a literary sense. I think it's also, it's, there's a, there's a peculiar relationship, and I, I don't know that I can, I, can, I can get close to defining it, but you know that sense of connection with the text, of reading the text of a poem or a novel and completely feeling yourself belonging to those words, that sense of intimate connection which is possible between a reader and a book, which is a connection like love. You also know the experience, I'm sure, of subsequently meeting the author of that book and feeling gross, intense disappointment. In a way, all good authors ought to be dead. I mean, we can... Yeah, I heard, I heard the beginnings of a clap going on there. <laughs> but we can relate to people like Dickens, um, I mean, any of the dead, as intimate friends. I mean, the moment we pull them out of the book, 
the bookshelf. Um, extremely hard to relate to most living contemporary authors, as it would indeed have been extremely hard to relate warmly to Dickens himself if you had been alive when he was alive. Um, would you have really wanted to have met Evelyn War? No. Um, Evelyn War is somebody whom I began to adore only after he was dead, because as long as he was alive, his 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 sort of presence, he'd every so you would ever every so often see him on television, and you would recoil so much from the man himself um, that it was impossible to feel that intimate sense of connection with his books. After he was dead, fine, his books became wonderful. Um, uh, I, I'm a sort of perennial re-reader of Evelyn Waugh's novels, and uh, thank heaven that he's, he's not alive to interfere with the pleasure of my reading or the, the intimate connection with the man on the page. But literary friendship is, is odd, because you have to deal with both the inconsistencies, the strangeness, the, the rub, the nubby quality of the writer himself as a person, even at the same time as you are reading the text, the writer completely transformed by his own language into something um, to which you feel a much, much more intimate connection than you do with the person who actually set those words on the page. And I think literary friendship is always sort of juggling this distinction between the writing and the writer, uh, sometimes in a, in a hard to manage way. Yeah, I, I agree. I was going to read something. How, how are we doing for time? I just want to read one little paragraph. We're doing, we're doing well. Okay. Uh, uh, just to return to Naipaul for a moment, because we're talking about people say, he's a monster, he was really rude, he was really weird. Uh, uh, how, I don't understand. What, what do you see in this guy? What, what's, and um, why did this friendship go on for 30 years? And very early in the relationship, in the friendship, uh, Naipaul asked me a, a favor. His wife had gone back to uh, London, and he wanted to stay in Africa for a while, and he was looking for a place to stay. So he said, uh, may I use your spare room? Well, this is my reflection. I was just a young man in Africa, trying to make my life. He was one of the strangest men I had ever met, and absolutely the most difficult. He was almost unlovable. He was contradictory. He quizzed me incessantly. He challenged everything I said. He demanded attention. He could be petty. He uttered heresies about Africa, things I had never dreamed to say about Africa. He fussed. He mocked. He made his innocent wife cry. I'd never seen a woman cry. You know, my mother and father were very happy people. I never saw my father make my mother cry. He made that, God, you're in the presence. I was driving a car. His wife's crying in the back seat. What do you do now? I was 24. What do you do now? I never heard. God, shall I pull over, do hand her a box of Kleenex? apologize. He's making her cry. God. Anyway, uh, what do I do now? He had impossible standards. He was self-important. He was obsessive on the subject of his health. He hated children. He said, I, I really dislike children, and I think a pregnant woman is one of the ugliest sights on the face of the earth. <laughs> he disliked music. He said, uh, I hate music, don't you? I said, no. <laughs> he said, you didn't cry. I told a man that once, and he cried. <laughs> Making people cry is one of Naipaul's great talents. He hated dogs. That'll upset you, won't it? <laughs> but, big but, he was also brilliant and passionate in his convictions. And to be with him as a friend or a fellow writer, I had always to be at my best. Now that's a challenge. I always had to be at my best. Just being with him, no matter what he said, I needed to reply, I needed to argue. How often in life do we have to, we, are we with someone who's asking difficult questions, usually saying, no, I want to answer it. But I, I knew I wanted to be a writer. He made me better. I had to be at my best, really listen, really measure everything that I said. So, you want to move in? Yeah, of course, move in. And so he did. <laughs> do let's have, if anybody wants to join in, this conversation. Do, let, do, do, do join in. There are microphones uh, by which you can make yourself heard to everybody um, at the front. I don't know whether there are any further, further out at the back, are there? I think there are just these two that I can see. I remember, Jonathan, in your book, Cruising, you mentioned Paul's visit to your boat and you both being rather cagey about 
what you talked about in, uh, according to your current work. So did this trust develop after that, or was that uh, a kind of an early stage where there was still, still some suspicion? Uh, you should, uh, have you read The Kingdom by the Sea? Uh, because uh, Kingdom by the Sea and Coasting uh, both contain accounts of the same lunch in Brighton in May 1982, I would guess, um, in which Paul and I met each other. He was wa walking around Britain going uh, uh, clockwise. I was sailing around Britain going counterclockwise, and our paths intersected at Brighton, and we incorporated each other into each other's books, uh, into our own books, not each other's books. Um, uh, and the accounts are very different. Um, Paul's version of lunch was very different to my version of lunch. The, uh, the two ought to be read together. Neither are true, <laughs> but both are true. Um, I don't know. What do, what do you say about no, no, lunch no, in Brighton? Do you remember lunch in Brighton in May 1982? It was during the Falklands War, May. Uh, yes, I remember it well. <laughs> okay, so I do. I remember it well. Um, no, you were 16. No, no, we could do this thing. It's like, it is like that, isn't it? Uh, well, the interesting thing is two people take the same trip. That's what this gentleman was referring to. Two people take the same trip. Graham Greene decides to walk through Liberia, takes his cousin, Barbara Greene. They spend months doing it, 1935. Green writes Journey Without Maps. Many of you have read it. You love the book. It's a dark, brooding meditation on loneliness and the African bush. But there's another book. It's called uh, Too Late to Turn Back. Its original title was Land Benighted. It's written by his cousin, Barbara Green. It's a different book. It's not a dark, brooding book. It's a jolly book about a 21, by a 21-year-old English girl, woman, who is thoroughly enjoying herself and poking fun at her cousin's baggy shorts. So there's two books, same trip. They were walking, you know, side by side a lot of the time, and sometimes she was in the front and he was in the back. At one point, Green gets lost in the book, and it's a metaphysical meditation on getting lost and the terrors of getting lost, and I might never come back. Then you read about his getting lost, she went off, she didn't miss him, and then she went back. Oh, they bumped into each other. Oh, silly me. <laughs> so there's two books. It's two people cannot take the same trip and have the same book. It's why one of the worst sorts of books, in my estimation, is the one that starts, My Wife and I. <laughs> because you know My Wife and I is written by some bullying husband who is describing his wife's reactions to a trip. And you know that that Mrs. Traveller, not Mr. My Wife and I, but Mrs. Traveller, finds this guy an enormous pain in the butt. Why is he writing the book? What about me? So, uh, so she has a case, she has a book. Let her write a book. I don't want to read books that say My Wife and I, or My Husband and I, for that matter. They, should, they each deserve the, their day in court. They each deserve to write a book, because you know that she has a version of the trip that you're not getting. It was in resistance to books like these that Jonathan and I began to write about our travels in a way which to a large extent hadn't been written before and saying things that had not been said because up to then, up to that point, travel books were a particular predictable thing and you knew that there was another story. Anyway, there's always another story. I think too that, that it raises the issue of two writers living in, living in one, sorry, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm jumping. I didn't see it. I just want to tell you, Jonathan, that I'm not disappointed to see you in real life and to hear you, and I'm very glad you're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was nice. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, sorry, over, over at this, this mic. Yeah. It seems to me that uh, fear is a part of a love affair to a degree. And I think, Paul, you have said that, to some degree, you were afraid of Naipaul, possibly the fact he was older, he was a wonderful writer, all of that. So in some senses, I wonder, is a literary friendship more like a love affair? 
Okay, the question is, uh, you may have heard it was something, is a literary friendship more like a love affair? Is that, if I get that right? Then I'm acknowledging, no. No, I think it's not like a love affair. Although, one thing you said, I don't think it, it's at all like a love affair. I think a love affair is about power, subduing the other person, wooing the other person. I want to pamper you, I want to be nice to you. Let's take a trip to Bali. Please sleep with me. I'm needy, I need you. Uh, and then, uh, can I be on top? Can I be on the bottom? It's all, it's the, the negotiation, the wooing, all of that, nothing to do with literary friendship is not that. Literary friendship, I believe, to be much more equal and not about strength, it's about weakness. It's about, uh, love affair is about power. In my opinion, it's about power. Maybe that tells you something about me. <laughs> if so, you know, there you are. But uh, um, that's what I think, that's what I think. But something you said, I found interesting, which is fear, the element of fear. Well, I wouldn't say fear, fear in, in a love affair, fear in a friendship. Fear is pitching it a bit strongly. If you're, if you're fearful, if you're afraid, unless that sort of thing uh, uh, arouses you, I, I think it's, that's a useless emotion, fear. However, there's a, a few degrees down from fear is anxiety, apprehension. Not fear, but apprehension. That's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. You know why? Because neurologically speaking, a fearful person has a great memory. An apprehensive person has a good memory. We tend to remember things when we're most anxious. And the anxiety in friendship is a good thing because it's, it's self-awareness. And you tend to, the animal that's kind of looking around and a little bit apprehensive, a little anxious, remembers features of the landscape. You remember things. When you're afraid, when you're lost, when you're um, anxious, nervous, you tend to remember. And people say, have said to me, well, how can you, you know, here's a whole long book. You didn't keep a diary. I didn't have to keep, keep a diary or I had just a few letters. Why did you remember so much? Probably because I was anxious, not fearful, anxious. And I wanted to be at my best. I didn't want to be put down by this man, of course. But it's not, no, it's not like a love affair. Love affair is in this barrel. Friendship is in this barrel. And this love affair barrel is a mess. It might burn it, you know, that's the thing, the greasy rags, that it might burst into flames. You, you, who would you rather go on a trip with? A pair of lovers or a couple of friends? <laughs> you know? I rest my case. <laughs> Laura Nisley has a quote from a woman that says, those who hunt buried treasures have to leave a little bit of their blood behind. And I'm, I'm just getting this feeling that you're being whiny, that you don't want to leave your blood behind. So, uh, can you explain that a little more? Well, just, <laughs> no, I can't explain just, it. Okay. You get it. Okay. That, that a writer is not what he writes, and that, well, this didn't turn out perfect, so I, I don't quite have it, but it... I'm, I'm unwilling to... What to didn't turn out perfect? What, what are you talking about? Your relationship or whatever. With an iPhone? Yeah. It was perfect. It was perfect. I mean, I, why should it be an eternal friendship? It's a friendship that lasted 30 years, that was very productive, that ended very suddenly. You don't lament that. You, you, you give thanks for, for, for what you had for the 30... 30 years! 30 years! You know, that's, that's a long time. No, it's not imperfect. Not in, it was a perfect 30 years and then a sudden end. I that, think that's why I don't lament. Do, do you know I what I mean? One of the things that, about this, I think, is that to an extent, every writer has to be a solipsist. Um, I mean, he may try and retain, re restrain his solipsism or her solipsism, but solipsism is, a, in a sense, at the heart of writing. You have to know that you are in possession at the moment which you write of the only world that counts, and that the version of the world represented in your writing is the only one that matters. I mean, it's incredible, it's egotistic, it's solipsistic, it's bad, uh, it's morally reprehensible, but that's, that's what happens. The writer in the middle of the book conceives his book to be the world. Writers who are friends of each other um, are in this curious situation that um, both being writers compete uh, and creating competing worlds, they're also in a position to test the fiction of the other uh, in a way that probably the second writer would not wish that fiction to be tested. 
Um, in the course of 30 years, I've actually known Paul well enough, and for a long time we lived in the same city, to be able to read many of Paul's versions of London, for instance, in his books, and think, ah, that's that person, that's that I mean, I sort of, I know a lot of the raw material that goes into Paul's creation of London in the 1970s. Not by any means all of it, or anything like, but, but there, are, there are bits with which I am familiar with. And I can see the fiction both as solipsistically self-contained, as one should, and also as a version of a bit of life that I knew. And because I am a writer, I also have my competing version. And I'm interested to know how far Paul's solipsistic fictional version of the world came into collision with Naipaul's fictional, solipsistic version of the world. At what point did these two round, whole, complete worlds come into collision? And what caused the collision? Because to begin with, I mean, certainly, as you describe it in Sevilla's Shadow, in a way, the very writer that you became was partially created by that friendship with Naipaul. You became a writer not in Naipaul's image, but within, within uh, 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 Naipaul's purview, within Naipaul's understanding. There was room for your books in Naipaul's own world at the point at which you began. Eventually, the world clearly became too small to contain the books of both Paul Theroux and V.S. Naipaul. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a question. Hi, as a person of East Indian descent, I'm, uh, I have a perverse joy in reading your book about Naipaul, and uh, I'm very happy you wrote it. Uh, I do, I've always had trouble with Naipaul's fiction. I'm, I'm sorry, non-fiction. I loved his fiction, but his fiction, uh, his non-fiction left me really want, you know, he wasn't writing from a scholarly perspective. Um, I know Edward Said has been very critical of him. Can you shed some light on his nonfiction, which many of us, especially people from India, find very troublesome and unsettling? I, I'm not, I can't shed much light on his nonfiction, but, but it's certainly an interesting question. And, and having your, your, you as a, as a witness to Naipaul's writing is really interesting. Uh, I had the strange experience the other day. Well, I've had it over the past couple of months, people saying, what are you working on? I say, uh, it's a book about friendship. That's how I thought of it. It's a book about friendship, beginning, middle, and end. Pure, perfect in its way. Uh, and they say, well, who is it about? What's it about? And I say, it's about V.S. Naipaul. And they didn't know who he was. That might please you in a way. <laughs> who is this guy, Naipaul? So he, he's not, I, in some respects, not as well known as I had thought he was. As far as his nonfiction, many people like yourself from India uh, have found Naipaul to be a noticer of irrelevancies, or Naipaul writing about caste, or Indian customs or habits. Uh, Naipaul has refused to take his sh shoes off when entering a temple on the grounds that temple floors are too dirty to, to walk around in your bare feet. So he says, I don't want to... <laughs> He's made himself very popular doing that. Now, I'm not going to take my shoes off. The floor's too dirty. And so they make him stand outside, and he makes a fuss. He's, you know, but he's the, he's the person who tests everyone's uh, compassion or everyone's understanding. Saying that's kind of weird in a way. It's, you may be thinking of his nonfiction. There's uh, Among the Believers. There's Beyond Belief. There's, my favorite book of his nonfiction book is, I think, um, an area of darkness, and his and several books of essays. Among them, one is called *The Return of Evita Peron*. But what Jonathan said is kind of interesting about this: the writers creating their own world and seeing what they see. We, you may see something else, but when a writer a writer sees something, writes something about it, creates something out of it, that's what he or she sees. You can't say you didn't see that. That's what he. That's what he's writing about. Although it may look like a fiction to you. Naipaul does that often, and he often is seeing things that you may not see, and they may not exist. Yes. yes. Hi. Um, this, uh, this, this friendship, um, to me, the idea of a fr of friendship, or at least uh, increasingly the most important aspect of friendship, 
any friendship, literary or, or any, is, is the ability to, is to see the other person's shadow and know that it's there, you know, the bad aspects, the really crappy side, um, and, and, and accept that everybody has it and, and go with that. And, and as you do that, the friendship deepens because you're allowed to have each side um, share that unattractive side. And it's kind of what I've liked about you, and I've stuck up for you in discussions throughout the South Pacific and other areas. Uh, sometimes, like some of your comments on the Japanese, for instance, and I've thought, whoa, well, that guy's brave. And I've thought, and I'm sure there's a part of him that sees a whole other side of that and, and really appreciates those people, that whoever it is you're criticizing at the time. And. So, what I'm what, no no what I'm what I'm wondering here is um, it, that's a pretty intimate thing in a friendship to be able to look at the person and you know they're really pretty unsavory side and because you do and because they know mine I'm f safe to allow that to come out and know that I'm a good person too even though I was a jerk or pretty bad in this situation and and then and the friendship deepens. But if I go, this is, this is what's going on with her, my best friend. She, this is the shadow side of her. You should see her. She's really nice in public, but you wouldn't believe what's going on at other times. She's a rageaholic. She's, you know. Then the friendship, I think, collapses because I think you've lost the, 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 um, the trust that you have. So I'm just wondering. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure. But... Did you violate your friendship with, with Naipaul by letting everybody know this? I mean, did he agree beforehand that it was okay for you to, to, to publicly let out his shadow, his dark side, you know? This is a good question. Okay. Though a rambling one. <laughs> <laughs> he said I was critical. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what... what one, when I was, for the 30 years that I was friendly with Naipaul, I never thought of writing about him. Read the book, you see, because toward the end of the book, I say, I, I describe how it is to have a friend with a shadow, with these problems, and you, you keep that trust. You're right. If you betray that trust, the friendship's over. So I knew that as long as I was his friend, I didn't, I was so, such, a, a, a good friend of his that it never occurred to me that I would ever write about him and I always thought a book about him will be written but it won't be true but and I will supply a letter an interview I'll be interviewed and I'll describe what my Paul's like you know and I'll say I'll, uh, the, the the six or eight anecdotes I'll never forget the time he blah blah blah, blah. the sort of thing that you get in a biography and the literary biography is not hagiography, but it ain't that accurate in many cases. It's usually, and as I said, you tell me you, the name of a book by a young writer about an older writer, which, is, which has every aspect of this person's life in it. Not just the books, but what he had for breakfast and what he said in Rwanda and what happened in Australia and the Indian books and all this. Describe the book. Even Boswell. Boswell tends, is a well-wisher, basically, of, and he was a, a good friend. But I, I looked for a model for my book, you know, because it's helpful. You read a book about another writer. I couldn't find one. Anyway, the short answer to your question is the friendship ended, and then I was liberated. The way that, uh, that the end of something, this is my message to you, the end of something isn't bad. The end of something is sometimes the beginning of tremendous understanding and enlightenment. So people may leave you. Love affairs may end. Friendships may collapse. You may get fired. You're out on the street. You say, oh, woe is me. But what happens is you have this tremendous, it offers you a, a vantage point, a point of view, but especially a vantage point for looking back and saying, aha, and an epiphany in which insights of all kinds occur to you and that's what happened to me the friendship ended i didn't betray him the, the the friendship ended my book describes how it ended it's interesting how it ended god helped me god put me in london he put naipaul in london god put naipaul at the end of gloucester road he put me at the other end of gloucester road god set us both in motion i had never bumped into him in 30 years i had never bumped into him 
anywhere, anywhere in the world. But at the moment when I wondered, I wonder what he's thinking. God set us in motion, two little scuttling penguins, you know, like those little going down a board, wobbling toward each other. And I saw him and I said, Vidya, he said, Paul, is that you? An apparition, I thought it was a ghost. I turned pale. My son was with me. He said, he, afterwards he said, Dad, your face. I thought I had seen a ghost. And I said to him, Vidya, so what do we do now? Because of what had led up to it. And he said, take it on the chin and move on. And I thought, I'm free, it's over. And I walked, the rest, he scuttled off to Hyde Park, I scuttled south, and I thought, a book. And, you know, I have it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> uh, this, so. And from the First Baptist Church of Pier 48, I think, <laughs> I think that is it. Thank you very much. Paul Theroux's book, Sir Vidya's Shadow, is published by Houghton Mifflin Press. You can write the company at 222 Berkeley Street, Boston, Massachusetts, 02116. Book TV focuses on biographies every Sunday at noon. Time early this year, puffs of black smoke started to appear in the press. Uh, betrayal, you will remember, was in the air. Linda Tripp had just shopped Monica Lewinsky, and Joyce Maynard had just shopped J.D. Salinger. And Paul's book, uh, which at that time was, wasn't even in proof and hadn't been read by the journalists who were commenting on it, was sort of roped in to this um, betrayal theme. Paul had betrayed his friend V.S. Naipaul. And there's the smoke of the press stories and the reviews, most of them written by journalists, um, has desperately obscured the true, funny, accurate, and affectionate book which I read as it came out over the fax machine. And I think our first G importance of being recognized by one other writer friend and of the importance of friendship in the life of writing. And incidentally, the book uh, was tribute to Paul's closest writer friend when he started out, uh, the novelist B.S. Naipaul, whom Paul met in Africa. And um, let me just quote a paragraph. A paragraph you won't, by the way, probably have seen quoted in reviews much. After all these years, I never took this friendship for granted. I felt lucky to know him, privileged to be with him, blessed for all his good advice, cautioned by his mistakes, stimulated by his intellect, enlightened by his work. I was aware of his contradictions. More than anything, I was inspired by the dignity of his struggle. Writing tormented him. He suffered through each book. Some book, Sir Vidya's Shadow, chronicling his 30-year friendship with author V.S. Naipaul. Next, biography on book TV takes you to Seattle, Washington, where Mr. Thoreau was interviewed about this book by another author, Jonathan Rabin, as part of the Northwest Book Fest. Hello, uh, I'm Jonathan Rabin, this is Paul Theroux, and <laughs> Paul and I have what you might call a literary friendship. Um, I say literary friendship, which sounds possibly pretentious, but um, writers can be friends with other writers without necessarily having a literary friendship. It seems to me that literary friendship is something that happens when the whole core and heart of the friendship is about writing itself and the writing of both people. Uh, two writers can go off fishing together or drinking together. They didn't necessarily have a literary friendship. One of the 
job in this conversation is to re-anchor that book where it, where it properly should be, which it seems to me is a book about the writing life and setting up shop as a writer and the, the crucial importance of friendship in that trade. Thank you, John. That's true. That's true. I, uh, and it's, you know, the hardest thing, uh, I suppose, for a writer, or let's say at the beginning of, they say in the beginning was the word, but in the beginning wasn't the word. In the beginning was uh, chaos and, and uh, confusion. Well, I started out as a very confused little boy, and then I was a confused teenager. I was, the, the, the desire to write is bound up with a lot of confusion. It's um, when people say, I, I want to be a writer, what should I do? Should I go to graduate school? I, I say, stage one, leave home. Just leave, go away, get away from your parents. And uh, get away from people who are going to ask you questions to which you don't have the answer. In a sense, all the, this search for uh, uh, an outlet for the... Aspects of our friendship is that um, we swap manuscripts very often, chapter by chapter, uh, with new works turning up on the other person's fax machine in episodes of maybe 20 or 30 pages of, at a time. And one of my great pleasures last year uh, was to have episodes faxed to me of a terrific book by Paul, which he was then writing, which seemed to me to be the funniest, truest, most accurate portrait of how one becomes a writer and of the writing life, um, true in every detail to the pound, shillings, and pence, or dollars and cents, how you make money, how you fail to make money, how it is to endure failure, and how it is to weather success, um, and of all the sort of small details of the writing, writing life, from the interruption of writing a book review to breaking off work on a novel in order to write a blurb for a friend's book, and centrally, 